Um, this talk's also about the environment and conservation, so get ready to be depressed. <laughs> Kidding. Sort of. Um, I'm George Bruggi. I'm not a scientist. I'm an artist, although I thought I was going to be a scientist. I actually initially went to school at University of Miami for marine biology and then switched into art, which seemed like a real left turn. But the more I thought about it, it wasn't that much. Um, art and science aren't so disparate in a way. You're using a methodology to investigate something that you're interested in. And so they really can kind of work in, in concert. Um, but this is the sort of stuff that I make now. Um, a lot of animals, which I investigate a lot and do a lot of research on. Um, the very detailed images, and those details tell a lot of stories. And the images are also um, usually pretty big. Um, and a lot of the stuff that you're looking at right now is brush and ink on paper, so there's not a lot of room for mistakes. Um, <laughs> it's like walking a tightrope. Uh, so the research up front really does matter a lot. Um, I think a lot about how we do see nature and how we see animals and how we see ourselves in them. Um, and I'm usually presenting stuff that's not super unfamiliar. It's animals you've seen, um, like a blue jay. But when you take that blue jay and put it in an unusual position and make it 10 feet wide, it's going to engage the viewer in a different way. Um, I'm not just trying to depict the animal as a subject of the gaze of the viewer. I want this to be sort of an interactive thing. It's not just observational, it's interactive. And the hope is that this will resonate with someone. They'll look at it a little bit longer, and they'll kind of recognize this creature as, if nothing else, a fellow inhabitant with as much claim to this planet as we have. Um, I also depict people, but when I do depict us, I'm trying to show us as fellow animals operating in an ecosystem, um, living, breathing primates with overly large brains. Um, because we are really connected to our environment. Uh, we do in New York City. We're living on an archipelago in an estuary right here, and we do function here. I'm really interested in how we mark our landscape, too, as a species, and um, the buildings that we decide to build, and the shapes that they take, and how they integrate or disrupt the environment. Um, and somehow how they can be a reflection of nature, whether that's in homage or, in this case, memorial, or it's maybe even a perverse copy of it. Um, I've been really mainly focused on the nature of North America. Um, I am a North American, and that's what I know most, and it's sort of the thing that resonates most with me right now, all the species that are here. And I'm really, really interested in the myths that are born out of the natural world and how they shape how we see ourselves in the past, um, like the reintroduction of the horse to America, um, how we see each other, ourselves in the present, how we maybe manipulate wildlife. And as we move into the future, I'm interested in how we see the past too, um, species like the passenger pigeon, which are no longer with us. Um, Anytime I've ever memorialized an animal like this, like a passenger pigeon, I've tried to really bring it back to life and give it a power, kind of like an icon, um, and make us really reckon with it and really look at it. And the level of detail in these things is important because there's something kind of devotional about that. Like you're giving this something that we took. It's sort of this reciprocal action again. And again, that level of detail can sometimes grab a viewer and they'll look at something and be like, oh, this isn't a photograph. It's like clearly made by someone's hands and they'll sit with it longer. Then you've grabbed them and hopefully they'll meditate on this a little bit longer and actually start thinking about some of the stuff behind this. And so this idea of memorializing has been kind of important and also depicting things that we've snatched from the brink, like the California condor with only 20 something individuals left when we decided like, meh, let's save it. Um, the things that I'm really interested in now, as we do move forward into the future, is Florida. And this is the place that we're going to lose first in North America from sea level rise. And it's something that is close to my heart, having been a Floridian for a while. And Florida is a place that's just kind of dying to be depicted because it's so weird. 
and weirder than even your like Florida man stuff. It's um, <laughs> like proper weird. And um, there's just such a bizarre mashup of species of North America and the tropics. And it's a place where you can legit have black bears and flamingos. Um, you don't think about that, but they're there right next to the Ruby Tuesdays wet t-shirt contest. Um, <laughs> And there are a lot of birds in Florida, a lot, um, doing lots of weird things and in environments that we sometimes don't recognize take up huge areas of Florida, like sugarcane fields. Um, there's birds in abundance and birds that we've killed in abundance there. And this is something I think about a lot and it's something I care about. And so when I depict these things, I'm trying to lay in as much information as possible into these things. And it's uh, the first, the reason why is the first step to caring about anything is knowing about it. Like if you don't know about something, you're not going to care about it. But as soon as you start knowing about something, then you start caring about it. And the way you can get people to know about it is by hopefully hooking them with some sort of visibility. Uh, all the stuff I just showed you is all kind of operating in the fine art gallery realm of the world. And in New York, that seems like a real world, but it's kind of not. Like, it's, it's very proscribed, and it's even a small world in the city of 8 million people. There's, you know, I operate in that world to a certain level, and, you know, you're bumping into the same people all the time. Like, it's pretty small and select, but still a world that, you know, I try to interject this stuff into, into the conversation in a way that, you know, doesn't always happen. I've also been lucky enough because these things have been so detailed and well researched to over the years have worked with uh, Wildlife Conservation Society. These are like a sampling of stuff from the Bronx Zoo um, because I was studying this stuff so much, making it anatomically correct. And it was exciting for me to be able to like take that and bring it into another realm and like museum signage and uh, this sort of stuff because you're your audience matters um and this difference between like fine art and illustration is kind of an interesting one it's a dialogue that happens a lot in art schools i teach at school of visual arts here in new york and it's a constant thing and what i always say to my students is illustration will tell you something and fine art will ask you something but hopefully a really good illustration will tell you something and ask you something at the same time and be more interactive and um your audience does matter like as a kid i loved these signs when i'd go to a museum or, or a zoo um, I got to do a bunch of stuff for La Brea Tar Pits, which was fun because I got to bring um, extinct animals back to life, looking at their bones and their collection and figuring out what that thing might have been like in real life and um, having them up on billboards in L.A., which was fun. Um, and just taking something that is usually depicted in a certain way all the time and trying to like bring back that, I don't want to say humanity to it, but that creaturism to it, and it's something that, we hunted out of existence, really. I mean, like, start looking at all the research now, like, eh, a little bit of climate, mostly us. Um, I also, for over 10 years, uh, illustrated the bird watch column for The Guardian UK. And um, if anyone knows anything about British people, they like their birds a lot. Um, and that's when I started to realize that there is something kind of special about birds, that they're everywhere. and there's a multitude of species and they're accessible and people learn about them and care about them. Um, and they have been the catalyst for a lot of environmental organizations like Audubon or Ducks Unlimited, a lot of these things. It's, it's birds that have brought people in and hooked them in in the beginning. Um, and the universality of birds really came very clear when I was working on a project for the parks department here in New York. It's called uh, Forever Wild. And there was all these certain sections of parks that were designated Forever Wild areas of the parks department and they wanted to get people out into those and to be just sort of aware of what's going on and i got out into those parks a lot and um you know you live in the city you assume like any nature here is just like super crappy and you know it's i mean really it is not a joke that people consider like pizza rat the nature here and it is true pizza rat is the nature here that's not fake but there's a lot more going on here than people think. And in, within the five boroughs, we've had over 386 species of birds recorded. And it's actually even a little bit better birding here within the city than it is out in some of the surrounding areas. Um, and also, people don't really investigate their natural areas that are right at home a lot. And those areas aren't garbage. They may have lots of garbage in them, but the birds and animals there don't care if there's a Gatorade bottle there. They're just like 
still doing their business. It's you who are bummed out by that, but it's still actual nature. It's nature that's changed and altered, but it is still here. Um, so, you know, there's like a ton of environmental problems to like get worried about. Um, if that's what you want to spend your night doing, like I do. Um, but at, a, a while back, one issue that was really interesting to me was um, certain environmental issues that were really, really invisible. And one was the big garbage patches, which now everyone knows about, right? We all know about that. And at the time, everyone thought it looked like this. And they were like, y'all, there's a, a continent out there. It's just all, you know, Dorito bags. And it's not Dorito bags. Like, yes, there's large marine debris out there. Like, that's, that is something that happens. But most of it is, you know, and now, like, I used to give these lectures like 10 years ago almost about this sort of issue. And people didn't really know so much about marine plastics. Now people know. Like, it's a thing. And plastic degrades and breaks down. And it breaks down into a problem that is almost invisible to a certain extent. And that's, and the dangers are invisible too. Like, choking to death on a plastic bag isn't a, isn't a picnic, but all the endocrine disrupting persistent organic compounds that are present in plastics is even a more insidious problem that is pretty much invisible. Um, and we've all seen images like this, you know, it's like, how do you then reach people about this? Like you can have like the sad animal, like, you know, you got, and these things can be effective. They can be effective as, as hell. Um, everyone saw that video of like the turtle with the straw up the nose. Um, this thing, this can be powerful. And people have made really good work about this. You guys probably saw these photos making the rounds over the years from Chris Jordan um, from Midway Island, albatross chicks that ingested so much plastic that, you know, died right there on the nest. Um, and these were really good. The pure documentation of this was impactful. Um, it's simple and it's devastating. But then you have to think about not just, like you guys were saying, like alarm. Um, how to really like pull that into something a little bit more. Um, and so I've been thinking about like, I make, you know, I'm like, I make images of these birds. Like this is something that I was doing already. Um, but how do you escape the trap of just like, you know, like a sad panda, you know, it's like, how do you, how do you make images that aren't just like, stop hurting animals. Like you'd have to try to like do something that makes it a little bit more maybe engaging to a certain level. So I started this project called New York Pelagic, which was a project where I started making drawings of open ocean birds. Pelagic just means open ocean. Um, pelagic birds that we don't really see. Like our habitats don't really overlap with these guys, but they are really deeply affected by us. Um, this is a, a Wilson storm petrel, one of the most populous birds on the planet, but pretty much no one here has probably ever seen one um, because they're not gonna be over land ever. Sometimes every once in a while into New York Harbor. Um, and so I made these original portraits of all these open ocean birds and put them into bottles along with a questionnaire and started chucking them, um, throughout all the waterways of the five boroughs here in New York. Um, and in this project, I was curious about who, if anyone would, would find these things. Um, there's this, access, there's this access issue too to the waterfront. And I started this project in 2011, and this is when a lot of new gentrification was happening along the waterfront, so different people were starting to come into certain areas. And weirdly, certain areas that had been left fallow for a long time were actually coming back and providing actual habitat. And it also brought up an interesting idea of like, who has access? A lot of immigrant communities in New York still were fishing in a lot of the waters in the five boroughs, safely or not, depending on the species that they were getting. And then all of a sudden it was being rapidly gentrified for only super fancy rich people to be right on those waterfronts, but also super fancy rich people who 30 years down the road are gonna be underwater and we're gonna be paying for their assets to get out of there. So I was really interested in who actually goes to these places now. Um, I was also really interested in value because I was throwing away something that has a market value. Um, this, like if you chuck 20 bucks on the street, are you littering? Kind of, but we recognize a value to something. And we were valuing all this plastic crap that we were making until we weren't wanting it anymore and then chucking it. And then it became a liability. And so I was sort of interested in that idea. And at the time too, I was living majority off just selling my work, but the people who buy my work are really, really rich. And so it was a slight also kind of democratization of like, anyone can have free art if you find this. Um, 
but it was it was an interesting project and got me out into a lot of neighborhoods and one discovery I made that was pretty interesting was old signage I had made for the parks department in an area that was going to be open to the public, but then wasn't open to the public. And all the signage was about how they'd done a lot of rehab in this area and taken it from an area where people were dumping car batteries and a bunch of other garbage. And they restored a, a whole, you know, a, a saltwater marsh and they restored a lot of other areas. And then to go and see all of the signage I had done totally overgrown was really interesting. It felt like a, a clear green shout cutting through that litany of loss that we're always hearing. Um, and it kind of turned into a bit of a writing project too, as I was you know, going through this all. Um, then bottles started getting found and you can't make this up, but the first bottle that got found and it was tossed, it got found only like three days, four days after it got tossed. And it was found by scientists studying how sea level rise is going to affect the national park system. <laughs> so I was like, even in the most randomized tossing this to the tides, I'm still very much preaching to the choir. Um, and I mean, you couldn't have scripted that part better. Um, but people had really interesting reactions. Like some people sent me bottles back with drawings and, and notes. Um, I was down in Miami for some of the art fairs and uh, I did a few bottles down there as sort of like a nod to the former hometown. And uh, a bunch of kids having a birthday party found a bottle, which was super cute. And it was a really awesome way to start opening up this conversation and avenue with like younger people. And you know, like every single one of these kids called me, which was hilarious. Um, and one bottle was lucky enough. This is Wolf's Pond Park right here in Staten Island that two and a half years after I tossed one here, it ended up in France. Um, yep. <laughs> um, and there it is, covered in barnacles, and found by this individual, who also happened to be an artist, which was really funny. Again, target audience. Um, and it was funny because I didn't remember, I don't remember that cormorant looking so shell-shocked, <laughs> but, uh, but uh, that amount of time at sea would probably change anyone. Um, and it was interesting just to think about like this sort of connection of like getting something over to France and I was the last person to touch this drawing, then she was the next person to touch this drawing. And you know, you start thinking about like the enormity of, of the ocean and this thing bobbing around and snow falling on it, getting beat on by like intense sun, like, you know, and then eventually it ends up somewhere. Um, and all of this communication has been a really good thing. And like, you know, you operate with something in the realm of like message in a bottle, like that's a super romantic idea. And I'm not a romantic on any level, but it is a really good way of engagement. And this has been a good way for me to engage with a lot of schools. And I have, um, I have a relationship with the Harlem Children's Zone, just actually very close to here. And it's given me the opportunity to be able to go into them and a bunch of other middle schools and talk to students about this sort of stuff. And this is really, really important. And then I've been able to bring in like other people who I know, like a coral scientist and talk to them about this. And I think it's really, really important to start engaging people who actually live in urban habitats like we do, because nature doesn't happen only somewhere else. It's very much a universal issue and problem. And everyone has a stake in this. And so I really think that what I've focused on mostly is reaching out to, to kids here, honestly. Like that's who I wanna contact and that's who I wanna be dealing with because this is their country too. And I'm very interested in the idea of, of which I'll actually talk about in a second, but like public land. And some nine-year-old in the Bronx has as much claim to any of our public land as some rancher out in Oregon. Like it is our public land and it is our public responsibility and our public right. And so making those connections is really important. Um, one thing that is a, one project that I really liked and that I got involved with is the Audubon mural project, which happens also just north of here by a little bit um, in Hamilton Heights where Audubon used to live. And the aim of the project is to depict all of the formula 314, but now 389 climate threatened species that are here and depict them all in mural form in the neighborhood. Um, and people have done some really great stuff. This is by an artist named Gaia. Um, this is an interesting idea just because you're getting stuff out into a neighborhood. You're also getting stuff out into a neighborhood in New York that is not, all those public art projects you hear about in New York, they're not happening up in Washington Heights. Like they're always happening in the like regular old places and like as if we needed the damn shed and all that stuff. But like it's always going to like where people already have a lot of stuff. And this is a project happening 
up north in Manhattan, where not a lot of people do a lot of projects. Um, and that's where I really started thinking a lot about like birds as this sort of like gateway drug to conservation because you can hook people. Um, the barriers to entry are really low in birding. You just have to really kind of have eyeballs. Um, you can get like pretty cheap, good binoculars and you can like download an app. You don't even buy a guide and you can get out there. And, um, a friend of mine does a club for kindergartners and in, in, he's from Harlem and it's, it's in Harlem. It's called the Harlem County birding club, which is awesome. And he gets binoculars into the hands of five-year-olds in Harlem to start them birding. And that's really, really important because they need to know that this is something there. And once you start getting people into birding, I have totally hooked people onto it. Like I'm a pusher on that. And you see that all of a sudden, like if you, it's, it's universal birds are everywhere. So you can contact someone in Ohio and they can get really into, you can't, you can't go whale watching in Ohio, but you can go bird watching and you're going to start caring about the birds that you look forward to coming every spring. If you care about your birds in Ohio, you have to start caring about your birds in Colombia and Jamaica and Guatemala and Nicaragua. You have to start thinking about it as a global issue. It's also one of those things that you can make a difference. Um, people are always like, what can I do? What can I do? You can provide habitat for birds without that much effort. Um, if you have like a little tiny, tiny plot, you plant your native species, you do your work, you can actually get birds in there and you can really start doing this. So it's something that people can do and care about. Um, so installed, start installing these around Harlem. I know how to drive a lift. Um, <laughs> unlike the most freezing day ever, uh, and start getting these up in the neighborhood. Um, and the first bird I chose was a black burning warbler. And this was the bird that kind of got me hooked into birding because I was happy enough to be, or lucky enough to be in the Great Swamp, not far from here in Jersey. And during a event called a fallout. And so during migration, sometimes birds kind of fall out and all kind of whoop. And a whole bunch of these warblers came down and were surrounding in all the trees around me and a bunch of them were black burnians. And it was the first time I was like, what is that thing? Um, so I started depicting all these, uh, another, another one, a gang of, a gang of five warblers looking very tough, um, cause they are going to be in Washington Heights. Um, and they are tough. Like I wanted them, people to see these as tough, like they're no bigger than a mouse, but they're, I was going to say commuting cause I'm such a New Yorker migrating, um, <laughs> migrating hundreds, if not thousands of miles and they're tough as hell. Um, and you also start seeing how they're different and the same. Like I chose a few species that have some similarities and some that are different. And then hopefully people will be like, what are those? And start looking them up and realize that three out of those species you can see right in Central Park. Um, installed this on like the hottest day of the year. And with like a lot of commentary from everybody in the neighborhood. And they were like, you're putting it upside down and yelling at me. And then that was a really good way to open up the conversation with them. So then I was like talking to all the neighbors and, um, and then I got to talk to them about the fact that this bird, the black cat vireo, I put upside down for a couple reasons. One was everyone used to think it was closely related to the warblers, but it's not. And that sort of turned ornithology upside down. And this particular species feeds hanging upside down at times. So it started like a conversation with all these people. And also I chose this bird for a reason because it is one of those, one species that was actively saved by the Endangered Species Act. And if we had not put protections in for this bird, it would have been gone because it actually has a really localized small habitat. And all he needed to do was, you know, with a lot of nature, all you have to do is like stop hitting it over the head with a frying pan for a second and a lot of it will come back. Um, and this is one that did come back. At the same time, I also installed a um, greater sage grouse, and this was this past fall. And amidst all the, um, I don't know what to really call it, shenanigans, tomfoolery, ridiculousness of everything going on in the government, a lot of stuff gets lost. And one thing last fall was a big argument about whether or not this bird was going to get placed on the Endangered Species Act. And I was very interested in that because the Endangered Species Act is very much at risk, and it's also something that actually works. And so I depicted this bird so that people would really hopefully be like, what the hell is that? And start looking into it. And this is a bird that is not just threatened by climate change, but it's threatened by the actual extraction of fossil fuels. So it's something that is, you can follow the money, like you can follow the money right there and you know exactly why they're trying to not get this thing listed. It's dollars. And I just think it's really good to open up those conversations. And you know, that's sort of like one way I can do it. 
Um, and it's really up to us. Uh, this is a bird that we didn't save. It's the great auk. And um, this painting, I actually literally just dropped this off yesterday. This is going to be on um, an expedition ship for National Geographic that's going to be going to the polar regions. And all the work is being curated. It's all artists dealing with climate change and, um, and the environment. And I don't want to just like bum out people on their trip, but um, this is something that I do want them to notice that like what they're saying up there is not necessarily pristine. Everything is changed. And I think it is important to look towards the past so that we can figure out like what future we actually do want to choose. Um, all right, that's it.